Hello, everybody. Justin Stivers. Thank you guys for tuning in for another episode of The Stivers Show. Uh, excited to talk with my guest today, Elliot Kula. Elliot is a, uh, like I was saying before, we started filming a, a real attorney. He's a, a very seasoned, experienced appellate attorney, uh, principal partner at Kula & Associates. Before that, uh, partner at, at uh, Greenberg Trog. Trog. Uh, Elliot, what's going on, sir? Everything's great. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me, Justin. Well, we were, you know, we got, we got a lot to talk about. We, we kind of swim in some of the same circles. Um, and I'm excited to hear, you know, your, your insight, because you've been doing, doing this for a little while. And, and I know really well known, respected in the community. Um, but before we kind of, you know, dive in, I always kind of like to turn it over to, to the guests and say, you know, what do you do? And who are you? What do you do? Okay, well, first of all, I am, I appreciate the comment about being a real lawyer. But as I've, <laughs> I've said to you, no one in my family thinks I'm a real lawyer because I cannot help them with anything. I can't help them with a traffic ticket. I can't draft them a will for them. I cannot incorporate any of their uh, ventures that they want to try. So no one in my family thinks I'm a real lawyer. They think I sit around all day. Um, so I am I am an appellate lawyer, as you said. It's what I've done since I started practicing in, uh, back in 1994. I uh, started at the Attorney General's office as an criminal appeals and then moved into the private sector working on civil appeals. Then I was in a small firm, then I was at uh, Greenberg Torig, as you mentioned, and then I have uh, this firm for the last 10 years now. We just crossed 10 years and I work with two amazing, amazing appellate lawyers and people, uh, William uh, Mueller and Aaron Daniel. I know you know both of them, Justin. Fantastic great people, lawyers. Great people. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to work with them and, and call them my friends every day. Um, they both joined uh, joined me straight out of law school. Actually, it did, in law school, they were clerking, and I'm just thrilled to be working with them. Did Did you always know appeals was where you were going? Because that, to me, that's always kind of seemed like a a subset of law that just is for completely foreign to me. <laughs> I think I feel like you kind of just know. It's kind of like doctors. Like you don't just wake up, you know, usually later in life decide you want to be a doctor. Is that kind of like the same with appeals? You just knew you wanted to do it. Um, you know what? I didn't know what I wanted to do coming through through law school, but I knew I, I liked law school and I enjoyed the, enjoyed law school. And then when I had the opportunity to work at the attorney general's office uh, and, and became very good friends with the bureau chief, who was my mentor for many years and still, um, you know, I, I it was sort of I was sort of attracted to the practice by the fact that I found someone who I knew, liked, trusted and respected as a mentor. That's what he was doing. So I sort of gravitated towards it in, in from that respect it also was it seemed natural because it seemed like an extension of law school I was doing the same thing you know parsing a case writing about it um, so I didn't have to learn anything uh, new <laughs> I didn't have to learn how to take a deposition or learn how to do the real nuts and bolts of, of, of a legal practice I was still in law school and it was it was great and it continues to be great and, uh, and what kind of drew you to, to big law working at Greenberg, obviously, you know, large national uh, firm, are they international, national, uh, you know, firm, international. Yeah. international, yeah. When that opportunity came up to join Greenberg, I was very excited about it because uh, the head of the appellate practice group at the time was Arthur England, former chief justice of the Florida Supreme Court. And frankly, I never thought I would get a job there, but I figured it'd be pretty awesome just to meet him. And, uh, um, so that was really how I ended up interviewing there was really just wanting to meet him and it, and it grew from there. Um, of course, we became very good friends. And uh, after uh, I left Greenberg and started this firm, um, uh, Arthur actually re retired from Greenberg and came over and worked with us here for a few years until he passed away. Um, so it was a really an, an amazing journey to be able to have made it there because I wanted to meet this giant and then uh, to be able to uh, be part of the, the closing out of his career and, and, and to give back a little bit to him after he had given so much to me. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so talking about, you know, uh, appeals, I know you do a little bit, we were talking a little bit about uh, trial support as well. So I'm curious, maybe talk a little bit about that, because just so people know, you know, that's a service that, that you all offer as well. And then, and then second question, you know, for the appeals part of it, I'm curious how much of your time is spent, you know, when I think of appeals, it's drafting, right, Dra drafting these just complex, you know, legal briefs. Um, but how much is also in court arguing, because I know you said you've got a substantial amount of open appeals right now throughout the state of Florida, how much of your time is also spent uh, in court arguing those those motions, those briefs? 
So I'll, I'll take the last question first because it's the quick, quicker answer. Um, oral arguments are farther and fewer between these days. Um, you know, it's always been the case in federal appeals courts that oral argument was the by far the exception. And now in the state appellate courts, courts the, the five district courts of appeal we have in Florida, oral argument is becoming the exception. So how many, I'd say we probably have maybe three oral arguments a month at this point, um, which is down quite a bit from previously. I don't think that has anything to do with um, the pandemic. I think it's just a function of some of the courts are, are granting oral argument with less frequency. Um, Third District Court of Appeal, for example, it, it used to be the situation where if you simply filed a request for oral argument, you were scheduled. Now that is less the case. They have reviewing uh, protocols and um, uh, they're more selective in the cases that go to oral argument. To your first question about the litigation support, um, appellate lawyers are always uh, part of the litigation support team. And, um, and that ranges depending on the, the trial lawyer you're working with. It can be anything from joining them at um, council table during a trial and giving them the elbow when it's time to object um, to helping with dispositive motions, drafting, helping them with strategy and helping them with jury instructions uh, and helping them with post uh, trial motions. Um, our practice has uh, been primarily appellate work. We've done some litigation support over the years, um, but not really, I have to say, it has not been an, a, a substantial portion of the practice. We certainly are involved in strategy and consultation, but our trial lawyers have not been looking to us to draft their summary judgment motions, for example. They might call us and ask us about a strategy that they're trying to implement or whether they should be implementing and how their strategy might affect an appeal, meaning produce an appealable order or foreclose the possibility of an appeal. Um, and I think it's just a function of the, the type of trial lawyer you're working with. Smaller solo firms, those will generally look to you more to help them with the drafting. If you're working with a smaller boutique type of litigation firm, they'll do a lot of it in-house. In they have their lawyers to do that. So it fluctuates over time and depending on the lawyer we're working with, the firm we're working with, and what the client wants. I'm curious, one of the, the when you were talking about, um, you know, the third DCA or different appellate courts are taking less and less, granting less and less requests for, for oral argument. Mm -hmm. For you, is that is that frustrating because you want to get in there and argue it and it's really, you know, they've got what you drafted, but if they have a question, it's, you know, they can't really ask you about it because you're not there. I mean, I, I would imagine that's frustrating. It is. It's frustrating actually on two levels. First of all, it's frustrating because that's our time to get out. <laughs> and, you know, that's when you get to be real lawyers. Um, and frankly, that's when the appellate lawyers get to, the appellate judges get to be real judges and put on their robes. Otherwise, their robe stands, sits behind their door. Um, my blue blazer sits behind my door and, and we're never standing behind podium and sitting behind a bench. So that's a loss. The other thing that there are certain points that can be made and articulated uh, verbally in an oral argument and that sometimes are not as easily expressed in a brief. And that's 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 just natural. That's not anything in, uh, uh, well, if you could be a more effective brief writer, you could say everything in the brief that you could say in person and, or everything you could say in person, you'd be saying in the brief. I hear there some are, law school professor saying that and it <laughs> is aggravating. <laughs> yeah, there, there are articulations. And also there's, there's a benefit to the exchange. There's a benefit to the exchange um, uh, that prompts new ideas. Uh, there's the spontaneity. Every oral argument is very well prepared and very well scripted, but there, there's still the spontaneity. There's still the sudden idea that is sparked by a question. It may be a hostile question, and it may have been a question you anticipated and knew you had no good answer to it, but by the way it's articulated, it may prompt you to say something that in a different articulation, a different form, a different use of words, and it does move the needle. And and you know, access to courts, I I feel like oral argument is only 10, 15 minutes. It should right. I wish there were more of them. I don't think there's any there are very few appellate lawyers who say, no, I'm I'm glad that there are fewer oral arguments. I mean, you know, listen, there are some people who get nervous going into court, me being one of them. But um, you know, that sure. Any chance you get to make your position and advance your position with the court, I think uh, it is good to have available. 
Yeah, I, I would it agree. It also opens up, and this is the, the final point I'll make on this, is that it opens up the appellate court to the public. And, you know, when we tell the, when we, when we put together a budget for clients and we tell them what we're going to do, you know, we, we say, well, we're going to read the trial transcript of a thousand pages and that's going to take us, you know, 10 hours. And then we're going to read a lot of cases and that's going to take us 20 hours. And then we're going to write something and that's going to take us 20 hours. That's your budget. They don't know what's going on here. And then we tell them it's going to be uploaded and there's nothing more we can do. You know, they, they, that's what I say about real lawyers. Their idea of a real lawyer is, well, aren't you going to put on a suit and tie and go in and argue my case? Um, the, the judge needs to get to know me. Now, obviously, that's not an element of appellate practice, but opening the courthouse and allowing the public to know what's going on in there, I think, is a, is, is a positive, a net positive for everyone. Yeah. I, I'm curious how much, if, if at all, do you, I'm assuming, but do you, are you appealing to the Florida Supreme Court as well? Is that a no, part of your normal practice or no? That's a, that is actually a smaller part of our practice. Uh, the Florida Supreme Court has very limited jurisdiction. And um, it's just that because of that, the f district courts of appeal are effectively, the, not effectively, they are the courts of last resort in Florida. And so you know, we, we, we don't, we don't uh, advocate to our clients to take a case to the Florida Supreme Court because of the limited jurisdiction. And so then it becomes a cost function and, Gotcha. Gotcha. It's not okay. a large portion of our practice. Our practice is primarily the district courts of appeal and the 11th Circuit uh, Court of Appeal and uh, district courts on appeal from bankruptcy court orders. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so maybe shifting a little bit. Um, so I know you're involved, you know, immediate past president of the Miami Day Trial Lawyers Association. You've been involved in a bunch of different organizations. Um, you, were, you were just president of another one right now, correct? That just ended? Yes. This, I just ended in 2020 i was president of both the miami dade trial lawyers association and the third district court of appeal historical society i'm not sure i could have pulled that off but for the pandemic um but it was it was uh, both are outstanding organizations um and have have missions that go uh, that are really um uh, I, i'm passionate about the third so, district court of appeal has been my home court for 20 20 plus years now so to be president of their historical society meant a lot to me so you, I know you've been, and I was looking at, you know, your bio and your website and, and you've, you've been involved in a lot of different stuff. Um, was that, what kind of, cause again, not a lot of lawyers, I mean, are involved in name sometimes. Uh, I think a lot more lawyers are just not involved at all in a lot of different organizations. And so I'm, I'm always curious, you know, speaking with attorneys like yourself who are very involved, was that just something intuitive that you sought out? Was it some, was it someone who told you, Hey, I think you need to get involved. What, what kind of prompted you to just get involved and just continue, you know, dedicating more time uh, in those organizations? So it is, it is a lot of work to be involved in these organizations because it, you still have to have your practice. If you're, if you're at a large firm and they're worrying about your billable hours, if you're at a small firm and they're worrying about your billable hours or you're worrying about your own billable hours, uh, it, it's time consuming. Um, for me, it was, uh, you know, people who, who, by example, showed me the, the necessity and the benefits of being involved in bar activities and community events and community functions and organizations. Uh, it also was, for me, a source of um, uh, like, like just something different. It got me outside of my office. As a pellet lawyer, you spend a lot of time in your office in front of you and Computer. So to me, that was also an, uh, an opportunity. And I also wanted to be able to meet different people in different practices, doing different things and, and, and have friends. It was a way to make friends. And I found mentors. I mentioned this to you before, Justin. I, I found mentors in my work for the bar. Um, and then in turn, I was able to you know, mentor some other people along the way. And that makes you a better lawyer, I think. And then in terms of, of bar committees, like rules committees, I was on the, the Rules of Appellate Procedure Committee. I'm now on the Rules of Civil um, Procedure Committee. I'm about to term limit off of that. Uh, you learn a lot about the practice when you start playing with the rules at that sort of a granular level. I would, I would imagine. Um, I, I'm, well, yeah, I, I got a couple of questions on that, but I'm, I'm curious, um, the, the mentor part, um, 
that that's been a pretty you said rewarding you know piece for you. How do you how do you find a, a mentoree and and get involved in that? What what's kind of your role and when you decide to to bring somebody on? Um, for me, it's been really uh, organic. Um, it, when William and Aaron joined the firm, um, that was an opportunity, and then they brought friends over who were also just entering the practice, and I was able to meet some of their good friends and and be able to be helpful to them. And listen, I got a lot of help from some really very wonderful people. Um, I mentioned Arthur England, um, but so many people. Elliot Shirker, my former partner at Greenberg Torrey, was a tremendous mentor to me. Um, so, so, you know, you've experienced that and you almost want to be a mentor after you've had that experience because it's part of you're modeling yourself after them and you want to experience that, um, you want to experience that satisfaction of helping somebody. You want to experience that sort of um, fulfillment of helping somebody. With, with, um you know, you said being involved in those president of these two organizations this past year probably couldn't have done it in any other year, but but uh, the the last year with COVID and everything. And and obviously one of the major benefits of these organizations is, and like you said, getting outside, getting to meet people, make friends and everything. And I know we've been on some, you know, Zoom calls and lunches and different things like that. They're good, <laughs> but, but they're, but they're not the same. Do you, what, what do you, you know, what do you kind of foresee in the future with, with these organizations and how they're going to be able to, to pivot and, you know, kind of keep membership going? Because it, again, I think a lot of people are going to be burnt down on, on Zoom and everything. And obviously we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of months, but I'm just curious what, you, what your perspective is. Well, I, I think my sense is that people are very eager to, to get back to seeing each other and being in person. Um, and I, I think that's going to, that's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. I think the organizations are going to survive. I think they're going to thrive. Some may merge, some may do more collaborative programs. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, the, the practice of law is by nature a social practice, uh, not just because of the referral basis between lawyers and, but there's an educational component of lawyers coming together. There's a serendipity a serendipitous element to uh, lawyer relationships and ideas. So I think I think it's an unfortunate situation. It's been very difficult and challenging, and people have had to work extra hard to maintain their relationships. It means calling people. You can't text these days because everyone's everyone's zooming and and emailing. And and so if you, you your friends, you call them. I have several friends that call me like every other week. Hey, hey, I'm just calling to see how you're doing. Um, you know, we do that here, not just with the trial lawyers we work with, but with our friends, our family. You do that now, and that's the way people are getting through. That's phenomenal advice, and what definitely a big believer in that. Phone calls, no, no, no substitute for that because we all get enough emails and texts right. as it as it is. Well, I know we're coming up on our time, so so maybe just you know one more question since. You know, you, the, the the mentoring thing and everything else, and a lot of people watching, um, maybe are at that big law and want to start their own firm or or you know tr a transition point in their career. I'm curious if you if there's any you know words of wisdom that you might have for someone who you know is starting out, transitioning, or, or just advice in general. I, I I have one piece of advice. I speak to a lot of law school classes on on appellate practice, bankruptcy appellate practice, um, and my advice is always the same. You know, pick up the phone, call people who you're either you're aware of and introduce yourself. Call people who have mutual friends. I always tell people, you know, if you call me and say, "Oh, professor, so uh, I was in their class when you spoke," or "I'm a friend," of so and so. I'm always going to take that call, and most lawyers will take that call. And if they don't, you know what? It's okay. You don't want to talk to them. But that's 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 what I did when I decided, uh, and I was you know practicing already for a good number of years when I opened this firm, and I called a few people confidentially and asked if I could talk to them. And you know, not everyone was responsive. Some people were less so. Some people were really responsive. Let's get together for a cup of coffee, completely confidential. Um, and and I, that's my advice. Pick up the phone, give a call to someone who you know, either directly, indirectly, or by reputation and say, I'm thinking of doing something. Can I talk to you for 15 minutes? 
guaranteed most people. And lawyers are good people. We're naturally, we're naturally built to help others and help others solve their problems. So if you call somebody and say, I'm interested in doing something, most lawyers, most good lawyers in town are going to want to help you. Uh, that's, that's awesome. So on that note, if people want to call you and find out how to get in touch with you mm -hmm. and, uh, and either, you know, learn from you or, you know, refer you a case, uh, and we'll put, you know, your con, you know, some website and everything, but is there a best way for people to, to get in contact with you? Yeah, let me give you the office number is great. We actually do not have an assistant or receptionist. So when the phone, rings, one of the three of us picks it up and you're instantly talking to us. And Aaron and William are fantastic people. I've mentioned them a few times yep. already. And um, they'll also sit down with you and talk to you. Um, and so call our office, 305-354-3858. Awesome. Elliot, pleasure speaking with you, man. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we get to see each other in person here soon. I appreciate it. That would be great. I look forward to it. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Justin. Take care. Bye.